This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 26b, Understanding Determinants. This lecture is a supplement to Lecture 26 where I talked about determinants, and in that lecture I mentioned some of the remarkable properties that determinants have. In this lecture, I'm going to go through some explanations of those properties. But this lecture is optional, and nothing I talk about in this lecture is going to be referred to in any of the remaining lectures in this series. So first let's recall some of the properties of determinants that we talked about in lecture 26. We said that the square matrix A is invertible, if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. When we have two square matrices, the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B, and we want to understand why these properties work. Remember the definition of determinants that we talked about back in lecture 26. We choose any row or any column of our matrix. We multiply each entry in that row or column by the corresponding cofactor, which is given by the formula that you can see here, and then we add up the results. And from this definition, we can easily see that if we happen to have a row of zeros in our matrix, then we could choose that row for our cofactor expansion, and the results would give us a determinant of zero. In order to understand the properties of determinants, we're going to start by working on some simpler matrices. And then we're going to see how we can put together those simpler matrices to find out why the properties are true. Let's start with the identity matrix I sub n. Remember that that's the matrix that has ones down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. What's the determinant of that matrix? Well, if we choose to do our cofactor expansion on the first row of that matrix, that row has a single one in the row one column one position and zeros everywhere else. And as we talked about back in lecture 26, Anytime we have a zero entry in our row or column, that zero is getting multiplied by the corresponding cofactor, and so we don't need to worry about computing that cofactor because the result is getting multiplied by zero. So in this case, the determinant of this identity matrix is just going to be one times the cofactor C11 plus a bunch of zeros. So all we have to do is compute C1 comma one. While well, using our formula, again, that we learned back in lecture 26, C11 is negative one to the one plus one times the determinant of the matrix that we get by crossing out row one and column one from our matrix. Well, negative one to the one plus one is negative one squared, which is positive one. And the matrix that we get by crossing out row one and column one of I sub n is I sub n minus one, the identity matrix that's one size smaller than the identity matrix that we started with. So now we can repeat this process, again choosing to expand on the first row, and we get the determinant of I sub n minus two. Eventually, we get down to the determinant of i2, and the determinant of i2 is 1. So the determinant of i n for any size n is 1. Now let's look at the determinants of elementary matrices. We talked about elementary matrices back in lecture 24, and what we saw in that lecture was that there are three kinds of elementary matrices, each one corresponding to one of our elementary row operations. We can scale a row of our matrix by multiplying it by a non-zero constant, we can replace a row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row, and we can swap the positions of two rows. So an elementary matrix is the result of applying one of those row operations to the identity matrix I sub n. So let's look at a scaling elementary matrix. This elementary matrix would be the result of taking our identity matrix and multiplying one of the rows by a factor of r. So what's the determinant of that kind of matrix? Well, if we choose that row, whatever row that is that we multiplied by a factor of r, let's do our cofactor expansion along that row, and we get that non-zero entry r multiplied by the cofactor k comma k. If it was the kth row of this matrix, then that's the cofactor that we're looking at. So what is c sub k comma k? Well, if we cross out row k and column k, that's the only part of this matrix that looked any different from our identity matrix, and so that's going to be the determinant of i sub n minus 1, which we already know is 1 k plus k is 2k, and negative 1 to an even power is going to be positive 1, so that's r times 1 times 1, which is r. All right, what about a replacement matrix? So this is the result of starting with the n by n identity matrix and replacing one of our rows, let's say row i, by c times row j for some scalar c. So this looks like the n by n identity matrix, except that we have a c instead of a 0 in the row i column j entry. So let's do our cofactor expansion along row j. When we do that, the only cofactor we need to worry about is c sub j comma j, because that's the only non-zero entry in that row. And when we cross out row j and column j from our matrix, the only thing that's different from the identity matrix is that c, and that c gets crossed out, and so that gives us the determinant of i sub n minus 1. 
negative 1 to the j plus j is 1, so we get 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1. Finally, let's think about the determinant of a swapping matrix. So this is the result of taking two of our rows of our identity matrix and swapping them. So let's say row i and row j. So in this case, there are two rows of our matrix that look different from our original identity matrix. Row i has a 1 in position j and a 0 in position i, and row j has a 1 in position i and a 0 in position j. This time, let's choose one of the rows that we didn't swap and do our cofactor expansion along that row. That row has a single 1 in position k, comma k, and zeros everywhere else, and when we cross out that row in that column, the resulting matrix that we get looks like a swapping matrix. It again looks like an identity matrix that has had two of its rows swapped. We get 1 times negative 1 to the k plus k, that's just 1, and so we get the determinant of a swapping matrix that's one size smaller. So if we continue in this fashion, always choosing one of the rows that we didn't swap, then eventually we get down to a 2 by 2 matrix, where the only possibility is that we've swapped both of the rows in our 2 by 2 matrix. The determinant is going to be 0 times 0 minus 1 times 1, remember our formula for 2 by 2 determinants, and that gives us negative 1. So to summarize, we've got three different kinds of elementary matrices. If it's a scaling matrix, the determinant is R, where R is whatever scale factor we used. A replacement matrix, the determinant is 1, no matter what factor we used. And then a swapping matrix, the determinant is negative 1. Now, similar arguments to what we just talked about can be used to understand the effect that applying a row operation to a matrix has on its determinant. If we apply a scaling operation to a row of a general matrix A, then the effect is to multiply the determinant by that same factor of R. If we apply a replacement operation, then the result stays the same. If we replace a row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row in a matrix, then the determinant is unchanged. And finally, if we swap the positions of two rows of our matrix, the determinant of the resulting matrix is the negative of the original determinant. So notice that these factors that we're multiplying the original determinant by match the results of finding the determinant of the elementary matrices. And so this means that when E is an elementary matrix and A is a generic n by n matrix, then the result of finding the determinant of E A is equal to the determinant of E times the determinant of A. And this is going to help us understand several different properties of determinants that we talked about back in lecture 26. First of all, it doesn't matter which row or column you use for cofactor expansion. We asserted that, but we never proved it. The square matrix A is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero, and the determinant of A times B is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. First, let's think about how the determinant of A and the determinant of A transpose are related. For 2 by 2 matrices, you can see that these must be equal. We can compute when we have a generic 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C, D. The determinant of A is A, D minus B, C, and the determinant of A transpose is A, D minus C, B, which is equal to A, D minus B, C. Now when we have a larger matrix, it's not too hard to see that a cofactor expansion of A using row K is going to be equal to a cofactor expansion of A transpose using column K. And similarly, if we expand A using column K, that'll be the same as using row K in A transpose to find its determinant. So why doesn't it matter which row or which column you use? Well, if we use two different rows for a cofactor expansion, we can use the fact that swapping two rows just negates the determinant to prove that those two expansions must be equal. Similarly, if we use a column instead of a row, we can use the fact that expanding along a column of A is the same as doing a cofactor expansion along a row of A transpose, and that the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A transpose. So I've glossed over some of the details here, but that's the general idea of why it doesn't matter which row or which column you use. Now we want to understand why the determinant being non-zero is equivalent to the matrix being invertible. Let's think about what happens if B is a singular matrix. Well, the invertible matrix theorem that we learned back in lecture 25 tells us that the echelon form of B must have a row of zeros. So that means that there's some sequence of elementary matrices that we can multiply by B that results in a matrix that has a row of zeros. And when we do cofactor expansion along that row of zeros, the result will give us a determinant of zero. But because we note that the determinant of an elementary matrix times a matrix is equal to the product of the determinants, this is going to be the product of these determinants the determinant of E1 times the determinant of E2, etc., multiplied by the determinant of B. None of those E determinants are zero. We know exactly what the determinant of an elementary matrix is. It's either R or 1 or negative 1. And so we can divide both sides by the determinants of E, and that gives us the determinant of B is 0 divided by the product of those determinants, which is 0. 
So if b is singular, its determinant must be 0. On the other hand, if a is invertible, then we know, again by the invertible matrix theorem, that the reduced echelon form of a is in. And that means that there's some sequence of elementary matrices that we can multiply by a to result in in. And so the determinant of the product of the e's times a is 1. We can expand that product just like we did with b on the previous slide, and then divide both sides by the determinants of the e's to get the determinant of a is 1 divided by the determinant of e1 times the determinant of e2, etc. We don't exactly know what that number is, but it's definitely not 0. And so if a is invertible, then its determinant is not 0. Finally, let's think about why it is that the determinant of a times b is the determinant of a times the determinant of b. To do this, we're first going to need to think about a fact about square matrices, which is that if a times b is invertible, then a itself has to be invertible. So let's suppose that ab is invertible, and let's let b be any vector in Rn. From the invertible matrix theorem, we know that since ab is invertible, the equation ab x equals b must have a solution. Let's call that solution u. That means that ab times u, which is a times bu, is equal to b, and that means that the equation ax equals b has a solution, namely bu. And since ax equals b has a solution no matter what b is, using the invertible matrix theorem, that proves that a is invertible. Now let's let a and b be any two n by n matrices. There's two cases that we need to consider. a is singular, or a is invertible. If a is singular, then ab has to be singular, because if ab were invertible, a would have to be invertible, and it's not. And the determinant of a singular matrix is 0. So since both a and ab are singular, they both have a determinant of 0. And so if we look at the equation, we see that the left-hand side is 0, and the right-hand side is 0 times the determinant of b. We don't know what the determinant of b is, but it's getting multiplied by 0, and so in this case the equation is true. In the second case, we think about what happens when a itself is invertible. Well, from our discussion of elementary matrices back in lecture 24, we know that A inverse is a product of elementary matrices, where the EIs represent the sequence of row operations that reduce A to IN. So A is equal to the product of the inverses of the E's, and so the determinant of AB is the product of that expression times B. The inverse of an elementary matrix is an elementary matrix, and so we can expand that product. Remember that we know that when we multiply an elementary matrix by a matrix, the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants and then we can collect together the determinants of the EI inverses. That product of EI inverses is A, and so that's equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So I hope this lecture has helped you understand some of the properties that we talked about back in lecture 26. If some of the ideas went over your head or you're not sure, don't worry, remember that none of the ideas that I talked about in this lecture will be necessary for any of the future lectures in this series. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.